Ladies and gentlemen, and everyone else, welcome to a very special edition of the International Summer Festival 2020 live here from Kampnagel in Hamburg. My name is Anders Siebold. I'm the artistic director of the Summer Festival, which has now been running for 10 days. This festival is a suggestion on how to present and produce live arts in times of a pandemic. And while we will be here in this hall of Camp Nagel for the next 90 minutes, there's a vast program going on, outdoor on several stages and in the halls, performances in the halls next to us. SARS-CoV-2 has, of course, influenced the way how we set up this festival, but it has also influenced the content of this festival. And this is why we are holding a series of pandemic talks. Um, this is the second series now, and I'm very happy that we are here with our friend uh, Hannes Grassecker. Hannes is an outstanding journalist who explores the relationship between technology and power. He's the author of several books and in-deep articles for major newspapers, and he has been hosting conferences before at the Summer Festival. And he's one of the best connected people I know, and this also proves the list of guests we have tonight. There is Malka Older, science fiction author, who will be with us, Peter Pomerantsev, one the leading expert on disinformation and working at the London School of Economics, and finally Ben Smith, senior editor at the New York Times and former BuzzFeed editor-in-chiefs at um, BuzzFeed Germany. This talk is entitled, I have to read it because it has a long title, Shared Based Reality, How Can We Create a Shared Vision of Reality in the Digital World? And now, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to Hannes Grasecker. So um, thank you, everyone, for coming. And uh, thank you to my panelists for um, to join in from uh, New York, uh, London, and Amsterdam. Um, we'll hold this discussion in um, English. If some of you want to send questions, um, you can do so on Facebook and uh, YouTube. And uh, we'll start after um, 60 minutes or so to answer those questions. and. Um, I'll start out with a brief description of um, the problem um, we're trying to tackle, and today um, we're going to present an idea on how to tackle that problem. And um, I think the general picture here is that we um, have, for um, decades, we've seen a um, decline of mainstream um, news outlets, and um, at the same time, we have seen the rapid um, emergence of social media and its um, algorithmic personalization of um, content distribution. So, um, whilst you know a shared um, common um, perspective on the world um, through such mainstream news outlets is on the decline, um, a, a rather personalized um, worldview is emerging. Uh, various um, tendencies are aggravating the situation. One of them of course, being the closeness of, for example, Donald Trump and Mark Zuckerberg, as is manifest in or has been reported um, by one of our guests, Ben Smith, here um, at the New York Times. And um, then another one could be a newspaper ownership, for example, by Jeff Bezos of Amazon, who um, acquired the Washington Post. And, and these are just two examples of uh, many such uh, singular um, um, singular uh, things that have um, contributed to changing this structure. And so, in 2019, um, Rand Corporation published a, a fascinating study um, drafting some scenarios uh, on where these tendencies will lead to. And um, in this uh, study, the um, threat of societal warfare, um, in the near future, 
Um, the NYT is the last general interest newspaper. This is the year 2022. Zuckerberg then buys the NYT and integrates it into its news feeds. The news feed is becoming the NYT, um, he <laughs> announces, and then it's getting personalized. So the news feed delivers articles based on personal preferences. There's nothing left to speak of a general infosphere, so um, a shared perspective on what is currently happening in a state, for example. So the US population doesn't have a shared um, underlying perspective on what to uh, discuss. Then, in the second step, two years later, populations have resorted into some, what they call, bubbles of beliefs, which become increasingly hostile to each other. This hostility is actually being um, stimulated, triggered, and fostered by foreign nations or uh, domestic actors who try to weaken the status quo or weaken the United States. St the study warns of a process called societal warfare, which is kind of a civil war, but happening mostly online, with personalized attacks based on all the personal data that is available on free markets. Because there's no privacy in data left, people have become accustomed to um, interactive environments such as Alexa today or uh, Internet of Things um, applications, you know, like a smart TV. And all this data is kind of circulating and enabling um, malicious actors to use it against individuals who dare to speak up. So it's kind of a trolling reality as, you know, a, a mainstream thing. You can't speak up without the danger of being attacked. So eventually people, two years later, give up and seek re refugee and protection through algorithms um, who manage their lives. These machine learning algorithms are complicated because they develop over time and are non-understandable to the people who rely on them. They exert power over people, but people cannot understand why they make certain decisions for them. Jamie Brittle has called it a new dark age, and the world's largest society is in dissolution. The world's largest democracy, sorry, is in dissolution. So today, we can imagine similar events in the very near future. We could imagine the Democrats or Donald Trump refusing to accept next November's election results. If Trump and his media base uh, would um, agree to quit reality, for example, we would soon have two Americas at the same time, both living in their individual realities. At the same time, internally, heated polarization has led to some massive internal split within the news, news media. A, between outlets, where different sides accuse the other of not showing reality as it is, whilst Fox News, for example, has used manipulated videos of left-wing Seattle riots. And then, internally, within news outlets, several prominent journalists, for example, have left the NYT after internal debates over uh, freedom of speech and um, the perspectives the NYT should represent. In Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, we have very similar discussions, as I know firsthand, um, leading to a hardening between uh, center-right and center-left. For example, um, you know, Axel Springer and the world of Zeit or Spiegel. And uh, maybe even a radicalization, as we've seen um, during the infodemia um, and corona. So today's plan is to sort of assess and resolve the problem. First, um, I wanted to discuss a potential solution to this issue and with the experts here in the room, and then the, um, discuss the general idea of taking the news out of the hands of the powerful social networks and create an open infosphere for facts. So the way we're going to do this is um, we're starting out with Ben um, Smith at the New York Times. Then we'll move over to Peter and um, we'll end with um, Malka. And to each of the panelists, if there's something that you kind of like wanted to um, ask back or debate during that, you know, during the individual speaker's time, please feel uh, free to jump in. And after that, we'll have audience questions. So. Here again, so Ben Smith, welcome. You're the media columnist at the NYT, 
the new Nicholas Carr. Actually, he didn't only run BuzzFeed Germany, he ran BuzzFeed International. And um, hey, Ben, I, I'm seeing you at home. How do you work these days? Um, I'm, at my, I'm at my uncle's house right now on the Jersey Shore. Like you, I work without wearing trousers, and I'm <laughs> glad that you have shown solidarity with, with you know, those of us in shithole countries by, by not wearing trousers here, Hannes. <laughs> Welcome, Ben. It's great to have you. Um, ben, you started early this year, I guess, and then came, then came the lockdown. NYC was terribly hit. You're a New York boy. And then came the Barry Weiss thing. At, at the NYT and the huge debate about Tom Cotton's, um, you know, um, little essay, plus the Black Lives Matters movement, and then the implosion of ad money. So I really think most of the people uh, watching here ask, you know, how bad is the news media really doing, at least in the States? Can you, can you give us an idea of this whole rant, you know, vision scenarios thing is, is really on point, or what do you see? Um, how bad is the situation in news media right now? Um, let's see. I mean, I think that you know the the coronavirus pandemic probably isn't comparable to the resignation of an opinion columnist. Um, the you know how bad is it? I think you know there are a few different things happening, and and I think coronavirus is basically accelerating everything. You know, there are certain, the advertising industry had been sliding. It is really in trouble and businesses, like including a lot of media companies that depend on advertising or laying off journalists. Meanwhile, there's this, you know, very dramatic shift that has helped the New York, helped the biggest American outlets towards subscription. Um, New York Times, the Washington Post, which, you know, but all, which also means though that they are thinking more and more about how do we talk to the people who pay us rather than how do we reach lots of people and please advertisers and stay in the center. Um, and yeah, the, and, and I do think the, you know, the infosphere thing is really, you know, is very real in the US. You talk, you know, I mean, it's interesting because I, I only started working for the New York Times and I was, when you meet people and you say you work for the New York Times, it's like sort of this weird Rorschach test. You know, people have strong feelings and they're, and they're a little hard to predict, but people have, these just wildly different feelings. And it goes in both directions, I think. Like there's both that obviously there's a whole new, there are a lot of people who say, you know, who say, who tell you that you're fake news. But there's also, and I find this kind of disturbing too, liberals in America now treat, at, tell, say to journalists, like, thank you for what you do. Like you're like a priest. Um, and I think that has its own sort of problems and traps. Uh, you know, that there's a sort of, sense that the that the media is out there fighting you know is out there, is sort of on your side as opposed to on the side of reality hmm. so do you have any you know l you know looking at it globally um do you think the situation in the u.s is particularly bad in terms of like if we look at the west or um you know democratic societies around the world in terms of of the media sphere, or do you think you're actually still doing quite good? You know, if we compare it to, for example, the Philippines. I think if we compare it to the Philippines, we're doing okay. Thank you for that point of comparison. <laughs> um, just in, partly, I think because they, you know, they haven't. The government hasn't yet shut down the main, you, you know, shut down the main national broadcaster. It's a very like, you know, it's a complicated mixed system. You don't have real central authoritarian control in the US, right? And so there's lots of different things going on. Everybody involved is subject to pressure from everybody else. I mean, the way the system works right now basically is that, you know, Facebook, we all live inside Facebook, which is like this giant shopping mall. And the journalists are sort of like hired security in the shopping mall who go like running to Mark Zuckerberg and say, oh my God, did you see these QAnon posts? And then Mark Zuckerberg kind of decides whether or not to delete them based on no particular rules, but more based on like <laughs> how he, what he had for breakfast that morning and whether his engineers who he likes are mad at him. So, <laughs> so um, may I ask it like, a, I, I was wondering about a detail, you know, if we talk about like the power, um, let's be explicit, what are the performance measures for your um, reporters and writers at the NYT, by what you know are by what standards are they? By what numbers are they actually being measured internally? You know, what numbers are you know, important for them? The New York Times. Mm -hmm. So I've only been at the New York Times for a few months, and it's sort of a, 
it's a tr very traditionalist institution. I don't think anybody is really being measured by any numbers. I mean, if it were running like a normal business, the numbers that they would be measured by would be subscription conversions. Mm -hmm. And I think you start to see other subscription publications moving in that direction. I mean, it's inevitable. It's the business logic. But right now, I think there's a sense that they want the journalism to be independent of the business, which it never really is, but which it kind of set, sort of can be. And there, so there's a tradition of buffering journalists from advertising that I think has sort of transferred to buffering them from subscriptions. That means that, you know, they're more subject to what their friends on Twitter think probably than, you know, and, and secondarily what their editors think. <laughs> That's interesting. So uh, could you just, for the audience, just explain what subscriptions uh, conversions is? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, you know, the Times has been had this incredibly successful run, you know, adding hundreds of thousands of people who will pay $100 a year, say, to do for access to the New York Times and to the New York Times recipe app and to the crossword puzzle, um, you know, like, like Spotify, like others, like Netflix, like subscription services. And, and this is broadly the trend in digital media that To the tech mobile technology has made it easy to pay small amounts of money on the internet and the new generation of media are taking advantage of that and and the times is probably the most successful in the news business at that and what that i think it means in the long term for the journalism is that the that, that the writers and that the kinds of journalism that cause people to click on the subscribe button when they hit the paywall are the things that will be encouraged Right. So, for example, in the newspaper that I work in Switzerland, there's this um, there's this percentage number of how uh, many of the people that have read your article or clicked on it actually um, paid for it or entered like a you know a subscription uh, thing or paid the daily rate or so. And the higher you go, the more people convert. Usually, it's two or three percent if you're doing well. If you're doing really bad, it's it's like 0.5. And if you're absolutely phenomenal, it might be up to 0.10. And then I get a letter, I get an email in the morning telling me like how good I'm doing. So I'm constantly being measured. And so um, I ask this because I wonder to what degree social media actually exerts power over news media. So I think most people don't really get like how powerful or not Facebook or Twitter can be for a particular um, news medium. So in Switzerland, Swi around 60% get their uh, news primarily through uh, social media. How's that, how's that situation um, in, in your, um, how's the situation in, for the New York Times and in um, the United States? You know, I, I don't have that number at my fingertips mm -hmm. for the US. Um, you, somebody can probably Google it while I talk. Um, you know, it's a very, I mean, it's, a, I think, you know, television remains the dominant medium in the US. The New York Times has a couple million subscribers, but, you know, that's a tiny percentage of, it's a big number, but a tiny percentage of the country. And I think one of the challenges is that increasingly quality journalism is, is going behind subscription walls, whereas propaganda is free. And so, you know, you can sort of see this situation developing where you have an elite that has access to pretty good information that they pay for and that, you know, 90% of the 90% are reliant on lower quality stuff, stuff spread on social media. That's something we thought, I mean, at BuzzFeed, we always thought that our kind of competitive advantage was that we were trying to do quality work in the sort of vernacular of social media that spread on social media and that as other places pulled back, that would make more space for us, which I think is true also. So I, I think it's a dynamic, complicated system. I don't mm -hmm. think it's that simple. Mm -hmm. So um, so uh, one of your prominent editors, Barry Wise, um, um, left the New York Times. Um, and in her, in her um, goodbye letter, she kind of like posted on her website. Um, she said, Twitter has become its ultimate editor. So um, Twitter is the ultimate editor of the New York Times. What do you think um, about this statement? To what degree does social media influence the work of your writers? You know, again, I don't, I don't have any writers. I'm just, I, I only work here and I barely work here. So I'm not like a spokesman <laughs> for the institution. Um, I think there's a grain of truth to that, but it's much, much overstated. Like in fact, 
you know, there's a family that owns the New York Times that is, you know, independent not only of social media, but of the stock market, normal stock market pressures, and pretty much does what it wants. The senior leadership of the Times isn't really on social media that much, I think doesn't care about it that much. I think that the culture of the newsroom cares a lot about Twitter, a lot about Slack. There's, there is certainly like a sort of digital culture that I think has been intensified by, by coronavirus because we're all at home that does sort of dictate and drive internal conversations. Um, you know, and then of course, like we live in America where there's been this huge turmoil around race over the last six months. And that happened at the Times too, but I don't think it was specific to the Times. It happened at, mm -hmm. you know, Pepsi. It happened to lots of companies. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I think, so I think Barry did, you know, Barry is great at fighting with people on the internet and throwing punches and took some punches and didn't like it. And I do think was in the minority, you know, obviously it's, is, is a center right figure who was sort of in the minority at the times, which is a center left institution. And, but, but I'm not sure, I think it was, basically, I think it was overstated. There are a lot, like there are a fair number of people with heterodox views at the times who say whatever they want. So her argument was basically that um, um, it's, uh, given that most of your uh, reports are being distributed, most of your stories are being distributed and pushed through social media, um, it's actually, um, you find the biggest readership and the, um, your, your, um, the, the highest probability to find a big readership is to appeal to a certain you know, community, a certain bubble. So the economics of social media actually foster that kind of like you know, speaking to your own crowd thing and so, as opposed to, you know, reporting the facts. So it's- I mean, I think the economics of most media have always enforced that. I mm -hmm. mean, if you look at, if you look at the British media in particular, for instance, you know, I mean, I think if you look at American television, mm -hmm. there's a huge business in appealing to your bubble. I do think that- Hmm. Oh, just a second, we can- Tell you the truth, uh -huh. there's a tension. There's a tension there, but I, but I don't think it's, I, I think she overstated it, basically. Uh -huh. So what do you think about this argument in the RAND study, the bubblization, you know, um, you know, like a, the idea of like a, a, you know, a coherent, you know, platform falling apart because everyone's resorting to these, you know, uh, ideological, uh, you know, safe fields and safe spaces for their own, you know. Um, what do you think about this? Is this, you know, is this coming to a point where it's becoming a real danger to have communication ac across, you know, diverse um, opinions or, you know, fractions of society? Is it, is it decreasing, like, the communication? Do you think this publication is really happening? Or is oh, yeah. This... I mean, it definitely is happening. I mean, there's no doubt. It's been happening for a long time. It's, it's, more intense now than it had been. Um, you know, I do think one complicating factor is that the biggest, the biggest break in American society, or one of them, is age. Right, older vote, older voters tend to be Republicans. Younger voters tend to be Democrats. It's a huge, huge difference. And those older voters are the parents of the younger voters. They live with each other. They are they are each other's Facebook friends. You know, so it's not it's not the Hutus and the Tutsis, right? I mean, it's some of that, but it but it's 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 a bit more complicated. Like you have you have families where the younger people are more likely to be lean left, and the older people are more likely to lean right, and they still need to talk to each other. So I don't think it's I think they ran the piece the thing, but you as you described it, kind of overstates the extent to which you can enter a bubble and not interact with people who aren't in it. Mm -hmm. But given this, and Facebook, you know, Facebook, like the defining experience of Facebook for most people I know, is having fights with their aunts and uncles. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, you mentioned this point, like um, you, you know, identifying as a reporter from the New York Times, and I've had moments where you know people are so you know I ideologically, um, you know. Uh, um, against mainstream media that they, they would basically be scared of talking to me. Um, and then I've had moments where I was being attacked um, and you've been as well. Um, so how does the NYT protect their 
their stuff, their reporters. We've, we've seen all these stories online about like how reporters got, you know, hit during these demonstrations. And then, but then again, there are these like terrible, like, you know, online events where somebody uh, falls sort of prey. How, how, you know, people can't imagine if they're here at NYT, they think, you know, you're, you're safe if you work there. Are you fully safe as a reporter? Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I have never been, I have not been physically attacked for my work at the Times. The only time I ever faced physical threats was New York City politics a million years ago. Um, the, you know, the I think that there is a question of like what security is in the news business that has changed a lot. It used to mean that you had policemen or retired policemen at the door of your office. Um, and that, you know, and now it's so much about digital communities that might be sort of organizing either mostly digital but potentially physical threats against journalists and so in a way i think that it's the good like the good security operations have moved in a way from a more police centric point of view to something a little more like intelligence where they're trying to anticipate trying to understand who is who could be a th who could threaten journalists and to keep it into sort of be aware in advance of where it could come from. And then to have a set of, I think, tactics that, you know, if you are being, you know, swarmed on Twitter, that you hand your Twitter account off to somebody else, that you put down your, you know, that you have a, a sort of internal support system. There's a very, the, the, the guy who runs security at the Times is someone who, who I hired at BuzzFeed and who, who came over to the Times. Um, and who I do think that I do think there's a big change in what it is to keep journalists safe that is so much now about understanding, you know, that that the threats are are starting online. Mm -hmm. So um, we have nobody protecting us as we work from home. Um, you know, we're there's we're not protected online. You know, we're using our computers. Um, we're not protected at home. There's no security guard. And I guess um, you know people who want to attack are are starting to realize this. And um, you know, there's been this discussion around safe speech versus free speech. And you know, Europe is so different. Would you would you be able to kind of like give us an idea what is meant by these like safe speech? This idea of safe speech uh, versus uh, free speech. How would you define? Yeah, I'm not it? sure it's really one idea. You know, I think there's a sort of debate on campuses around, you know, safe spaces, I guess, like physical spaces where, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the idea that, and I, I mean, I, there are a lot of different, different conversations happening, which range from ridiculous to very serious, I think. I mean, I do think that, you know, there is this thing, you know, it's, it's hard to have a conversation, a, a, a real conversation about hard topics on social media, because you will be brigaded by thousands of people threatening you and, you know, if you're a woman, you know, with a sort of sexual edge, um, if you're black with a racist edge and targeting you and it, and I think there is this, and I mean, I think the question of how do you make these platforms places that normal conversations can happen, you know, you don't need the jargon, but obviously this is what the people who run Twitter are in particular, I think, and I think have actually made a lot of progress on over the last year. It's not great, but it's, um, but it's, you know, but, but these platforms can't function if there isn't some ability to speak. I do. And, and hmm. yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think I, that's a broad, uh, sorry, I, I don't really understand the question. No, it's, um, you know, um, let's go to one of those premises. Um, do you think there's some sort of a um, shared reality in the U.S. Uh, as of today? Is there some sort of like a general, you know, thing where you would agree on that currently you're still in a situation where, you know, um, people can know what's going on in general. They just have probably different perspectives on it, but it's, it's actually a, a working information system. Or do you think it has no, fallen I don't apart? So. No, I think it's fallen apart. I mean, I think, you know, COVID is this central, central crisis in every country in the world, but it has like partisanized in the US in a way that seems unique almost, that you really have these deep partisan divides around just, you know, what the facts are. Do you need to wear, you know, it, does it help you to wear a mask? Does this random drug that Donald Trump likes save your life? Um, 
And I think there is, you know, you could say there is an underlying policy dispute, which is, is it a, maybe we should just let more old people die? But I don't really think that's it. No one will really say that. And it's much more just, I think, these, as, as you said, these alternate infor information spaces. I mean, it is an unusual situation because the president of the United States is really creating one of them. And I don't know what happens if he's not president. I mean, his power does not primarily come from Facebook. It comes from the presidency. Hmm. So um, let's, let's um, move to, thank you, Ben. Let's move to this um, proposal that I want to lay out. So um, I, I, I do believe, um, you know, looking at how um, people really like to um, still read the news and how they um, share um, a lot of, you know, reports wildly, um, you know, consumption of news is actually not the pro problem. So I think the news in itself, new the journalism in itself is doesn't have to be reformed. But I think we need a new form of, you know, paper as a you know medium that has disappeared. A new way to sort of like distribute um, information and news, which is safer against you know more safe against manipulation, but also more resilient against like particular business interests. So um, I think we have to build like, um, if people consume news mostly through social media, if they get it on Twitter, Facebook and whatever, um, we should probably think about rather than fighting these um, news companies, we should rather think about building a social network for news. Um, a separate, you know, alternative way for outlets to publish their content. Um, you know, it's like, it kind of like, I think of a, like a street system where you build the roads and the infrastructure, and then you allow all cars that meet like certain safety, um, you know, standards to kind of circulate and use this infrastructure. So it would be open to everyone who kind of like um, is within certain, um, you know, um, fulfills certain criteria. And um, every citizen would have like a login the same way, you know, in Switzerland and Germany and Austria, we have these like national public broadcasters, um, just like the BBC in the UK, for example. Um, and it would be like a public uh, social network for news. And the idea basically is to create a, a sovereign uh, infosphere that is um, accessible um, for everyone in the population um, who lives in the country. And to kind of like, you know, if we have all these issues about like how Facebook and Twitter are, you know, moderating their content and censoring or not, and then if we have this discussion about like algorithmic distribution, we would actually, you know, have control over this ourselves if we would run it um, domestically, for example. And um, so my idea was uh, at least um, in Switzerland to start out and set up a Swiss um, national network for uh, news. And um, we would have, uh, you know, the um, Swiss public broadcaster probably running it technically and every private uh, accredited uh, producer of news such as, you know, uh, from left to right, which fulfills, for example, the Swiss uh, press standards could like um, put up his uh, content on such a platform. That's the, that's the general vi vision that I'm having. And um, for this um, discussion, um, probably we are moving forward to Peter now. Peter Pomerantsev is a former um, film producer, cameraman and director whose firsthand experience of how Putin um, built his Russian media empire during the uh, Nord, during this uh, early 2000s turned him um, into one of the world's foremost experts on Russian disinformation. He's the author of two great books, which I um, cite here in German. Nichts ist wahr und alles ist möglich, Abenteuer in Putins Russland, which is a fantastic book about, um, about how these early years and how he himself worked in this um, machinery that was actually being changed through Putin. And then his new book um, that just came out in German, Das ist keine Propaganda, wie unsere Wirklichkeit zertrümmert wird. Peter actually understands German, so I think he approved of the titles. And um, here's a quote. Um, After nearly a decade in Moscow, 
Peter returned to London in 2010 because he wanted to live in a world where words have meaning, where every fact was not dismissed with triumphant cynicism as just public relations or information war. But then with Brexit and Donald Trump's election, the Russia he had known seemed suddenly all around me. A radical r relativism that implies truth is unknowable. Uh, the, he's sort of the man who saw the future, and that's his claim. And in your second book, you investigate these latest developments around the world, Peter. And so I was wondering, you've just published the results of a, a working group um, with Annenberg um, arguing to regulate social media um, according to certain standards of transparency. Could you, could you talk to us about this idea of um, how you think you can um, basically regulate the existing um, um, social media companies to you know, deliver a better result on, on news? Well, listen, I think, um, I think it's very important in these sort of vast discussions to bring things down to something that is really kind of quite understandable to me anyway, hmm. um, which is kind of the right of the individual to understand how the world around them is created, manipulated, and shaped. That's an old demand. It's an old demand for more information. But we live in this weird world where we have more noise than ever before, more information than ever before in the sense of tweets, posts, Zoom chats, you know. But we know less than ever before about how that information is shaped. So we actually have a, we live in a new form of censorship. We don't, we don't understand why an algorithm shows us one piece of content and not another. We don't understand whether something online is an authentic person or an inorganic campaign. We don't understand which of our own data is being used to target us by political forces, by journalists, by anyone. So I always compare us to Prospero in The Tempest, which obviously everybody here listening has, you know, knows their Shakespeare inside out, but it, he's like, uh, Prospero is this kind of like, um, this, this victim who lives on an island controlled by a magician who's constantly changing the weather and the sounds and the noises and the ghosts. And this poor savage lives us on this island, not understanding anything around him. And that's how we live today. So it's this huge paradox. Look, the old media system, let us not romanticize it, but at least I knew this TV channel is owned by Rupert Murdoch. This newspaper is owned by Rupert Murdoch. And, you know, this is also owned by Rupert Murdoch. Everything's owned by Rupert Murdoch, but at least I know it's Rupert Murdoch. I know his agenda. I know what he's trying to do. And as a little Caliban on this island of information, I can think critically. I keep on hearing these suggestions that we need media literacy. If people could think critically, they could navigate the internet. You cannot interpret a text that is closed. The most important information on the internet is shut. So we have to have public oversight of algorithms. We have to have an individual online should understand why he's seeing one piece of information, not another. You know, when I type in on Google, the war in Syria, I should understand why the top 20 stories are from Russia today and the next 10 stories from Assad TV. Yeah. And so on and so forth. On Facebook, you talk about the search for a shared reality. You know, my mother, you know, and I are seeing different things on Facebook though we're friends on Facebook. We should be understanding how that's being curated, how that's being curated. It's a basic right. I'm not asking for something new. Article 19 of the Declaration of Human Rights talks about the right to transmit information. And I think that right is stronger than ever today. You know, even in totalitarian regimes, you could, it's easier to express yourself than ever before. But I also have the right to understand how the information around me is shaped. And that's where we are in this very strange paradox that we live in. So look, the, the paper that I worked on together with experts from America and from Britain and from the EU, people with very different philosophies about regulating speech from libertarians who think that any kind of regulation of speech is fascism 
through to security people who want to stop Russian information war. We couldn't really agree on regulating speech and how to regulate speech, but we all agreed that we have the right to understand much more. You know, once this kind of backstage of how the internet is created is ripped away, then we can have a public discussion about what sort of algorithms do we need? Are they causing extremism? Are they causing the, you know, the, the breaker parts of, of reality? What does that even mean? Um, you know, are, is what you're seeing online organic from a real person? Or is it actually a campaign from, St. Petersburg or from um, Texas? So that's kind of the main gist of the, of the paper, though it goes into a lot of details about precisely the kind of transparency we need. You okay, Hannes? You're, you're wiggling your finger in a concerned way. Oh, no, that's just because I don't see you, as opposed to the audience. Um, I have a screen in front of me, and the audience sees you just above my head in a, on a gigantic um, football field-sized um, you know, um, thing here. And um, yeah, now I see you back again. I was just telling um, the technicians. And so, but the assumption still is that um, there would be some like governmental oversight over existing social media companies. It's not to build an, a separate system for um, the distribution of... of That's, that I think is it. So this was a paper about regulation and how do we create regulation? Because there's a lot of regulation being created already and it's shit, um, especially the German one. The, the, the understandable but utterly mistaken reaction of democracies, I'm not even talking about authoritarian regimes, has been to think in the logic of how we regulate broadcast media, which is around content. You know, when there's 10 TV channels, you can kind of regulate the content on, on these TV channels and check the news. Is it balanced? In, our, in Britain, for example, we have a regulator that checks that all the news on TV is fair, accurate, and balanced. Mm -hmm. In America, you don't have that. We can discuss the consequences. Um, but you cannot apply this to user-generated content on Facebook. I would love to call a regulator and say, my mother has just posted something really stupid about uh, the American election. Do something about it, please. It's outrageous. I mean, what, we're gonna regulate every statement on Facebook made by normal people? It's ridiculous. But this is what your wonderful NetsDG law in Germany suggests. It suggests that we should take regulation about blasphemy from I think the 16th century and apply it to social media. Yeah? Mm. Let's regulate every comment on social media. Yeah. It shows a complete illiteracy by our, uh, by our, by our kind of... Oh, no, I, 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 I wouldn't fully our, agree our, on our that. Opinion. It's a great first step, isn't it? Um, because uh, what, 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 what was your proposal then? It shouldn't really be about speech. We can think about in terms of campaigns. Yeah? So it's no problem if one person says something stupid online. The problem is when you have a huge campaign in order to push this, when you have algorithms that promote it, when you have algorithms that actually are rigged towards taking the most vile things and amplifying it, you have to regulate the architecture. That's the difference between the internet. If one person stands on a street corner, says something stupid, fine. If somebody says something stupid on Facebook, fine. The problem is a whole design that will then boost that and promote it, and which is designed in such a way that you can covertly push this. That's what we have to look at, the design and the behavior, rather than a single statement. Could you, could you give us an example of um, how you've seen such, you know, um, you know governance through, you know, media, uh, inf sorry, information campaigns playing out in, like, um, Russia or a more recent example from your, from your uh, latest book, just, so that, just that people can imagine um, what you mean by campaigns? Sure. I mean, look, let's, you mentioned the Philippines. Let's take the Philippines uh, simply because the Philippines has one of the highest uses of social media per capita. It's a very Facebookized society. So when I interviewed people who helped put the current president in power, who's now shutting down broadcasters, you know, they told me very openly. And these camp such campaigns uh, created everywhere, how they would create dozens and dozens of Facebook groups, yeah, uh, which looked organic, but were actually created for a reason to slowly build up an audience and then very subtly push the main agenda that the president wanted, which is drug crime. So stories about drug crime at 6 p.m. every day 
and then comments made by bot by you know which look organic but are actually created as part of a black pr campaign saying well this crime we think it's li linked to drugs somebody really needs to do something about drug crime in the philippines which was the main platform of the candidate we see this again and again in america the, what look like local news sites which were actually created as part of a campaign they're not news sites at all they're created as part of a, i think one was a by an evangelical group that was supporting Trump in order to plant stories that were beneficial, uh, stories real and unreal, which were beneficial to Trump. So this sort of thing, this sort of mass coordinated inauthentic behavior. Um, that's on the part, of, you know, but that's on the point, you know, that's the campaigns that we're talking about. Um, even more important than that are the algorithmic choices that are made, and they are choices uh, to promote certain types of content over another. We have whistleblowers from YouTube who, who would tell you know, the, the management at Google that the way we've divined, designed the YouTube algorithm, it promotes conspiracy theories and extremism because that's what gets uh, very, very easy clicks. And they said, look, we should change the algorithm. We shouldn't be promoting this stuff. And, and you know, I don't want to get sued, but this is, what's the, uh, this is what, what the whistleblowers say. Google were uninterested. They were only interested in algorithms which got the most amount of clicks which were often the most harmful ones so thank you peter so as we're talking about solutions and uh you say um the the previous attempts to yeah, regulate um social media and the internet um probably um have uh, failed how would you um how would you basically put this in place how would you be able uh to um exert a certain amount of control over um social media companies it's it's targeting social media companies in particular right i think at the moment because they're the biggest ones you're quite right there's this question of scale do we start targeting every small company what's the size that we start regulating ads and we have some suggestions that, that there's a moment at which companies become so big they have huge social impact and they need to be regulated um look we're heading towards regulation the question is what regulation do we have clever regulation or do we have stupid regulation so we're moving towards regulation in the EU. There's a new directive coming out. We're hurtling towards regulation in Britain with the online harms bill. There are fantastic um, proposals about regulation in the US, um, which we'll have to discuss after the election, um, which, I mean, that's a lot of them have got to do with things like um, algorithmic justice to make sure that algorithms don't aren't biased towards certain people, don't prejudice against certain people. Mm -hmm. um, But, but look, when we're all moving towards regulation, it'll happen because the EU is a giant. The EU regulation is going to be really, really important. So you think um, the we'll EU is, is strong enough to um, basically yeah, regulate? Yeah, it's, it's one of the biggest markets in the world, and it, will be, it could well become a norm setter. So what happens in the EU? And, you know, oversight of algorithms is one of the things that's being discussed. Um, that might well have... Uh, impacts globally because you know companies mm. will want to stay in line with you. So um, look, it's going to be very messy. It's not going to be simple. And you, I'm not a lawyer. I'm, a, I'm just, as you say, a, a humble. What was it? What did you call me? A humble uh, cameraman. That's not something I ever was, but I'll be that as well. So you need to talk to lawyers like Marita Shaka, who, who and, and, and lawmakers to get into the weeds of it. I'm much more interested in kind of the philosophy of the regulation and 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 the kind of the idea behind the regulation. And its foundation in, a, in an idea of, of, of rights. Um, you know, lawyers will debate the details forever. But, but I think we have to have a philosophical basis for the regulation, which is very different to the logic of Putin and Xi Jinping, because they don't want a transparent internet. They don't want an internet where they show their own people how they're manipulating their data, how they're manipulating the algorithms. I'm interested in the relationship of democracy and regulation. How do we create a liberal regulation, which is very different to the regulation being proposed by Xi Jinping and Putin, which is about regulating content. They want a sovereign internet which blocks forms of content. Right, because, um, you know, if you look at Belarus today, for example, and, and the situation, how it plays out there right now, it's, to me, it appears somehow as if there's a battle between Lukashenko and Telegram. Because the opposition <laughs> is organizing through uh, Telegram, was the internet is being sort of like shut down, and um, you know he can't kind of like shut down Telegram. So I was wondering, on your perspective, so if we look at the power of social media in this, 
you know, small nation state, um, are we seeing an example of how basically, um, you know, a social medium or a messaging service or a networking service is basically taking down a country just by offering a sort of, you know, information infrastructure for its citizens, a coordination infrastructure? Is it actually sure. dangerous, Telegram? Is Telegram dangerous? I mean, look, there's, there's a lot of, uh, there are interesting questions you, ra you raise there. Firstly, in, you know, let's not get, let's not romanticize. We've been here before. We already thought Facebook and Twitter were liberational tools, emancipatory tools during the Arab Spring, during the Maidan in Ukraine, during uh, the protests in Russia in 2012, during during protests really throughout the world from, you know. Right, and uh, Telegram is owned by this single individual, right? Or at least, um, you know, there's this single founder, Durov, who sends mm -hmm. me his Telegram updates on what he plans to do next. So he's the mm -hmm. king of Telegram, basically, mm -hmm. you know, um, commanding his empire, isn't it? Yeah, so, and, and as Zuckerberg is at Facebook. No, but what we've seen in the past is, is look, these, these technologies, they can just as easily be used for, for evil as well as for good. So in this context, it's played an emancipatory role. Telegram in Ukraine is used for the opposite. It's used by Russia very strongly to undermine Ukraine's uh, democratic processes. So, look, the, these tools, they can be used in different ways. Um, I, I wouldn't idolize any tool uh, as such. Um, here it's playing a positive effect, but, you know, tomorrow the Russians will create a thousand of their own telegram channels. It's not, you know. So these things are just situational. So, but it's kind of a fairly sovereign infosphere because, you know, it's, it's run on servers. We don't know how to kind of like shut it down. Russia has tried to, and, um, you know, you've written about disinformation, meaning, you know, the attack on or the, 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 you know, um, foreign disinformation as well. But, could you talk uh, a little bit about how Russia has tried to create its like own sovereign infosphere, tried to create its own like internet in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, um, do you think this is sort of an example or is it a bad example or is it the worst case? So, so Russia hasn't gone as far as China. So obviously it hasn't created a firewall. It doesn't have, uh, so it kind of, Russia did three things after 2012 when there were mass protests in Russia, which had been organized online. And the government realized that it had let the internet slip and they need to find ways of dominating it. And they really created three, three ways of, of dominating the internet. One of them is um, the most powerful one, I think. It's a series of laws about online extremism, yeah? Which can mean anything they want it to mean. You create a law about online extremism, suddenly people start getting jailed for liking an article about politics in Ukraine. So that legal pressure is really, really important. And in that classic Russian way, you have a few show trials. You arrest a few people for ridiculous things online. You shut, the, you shut them away and you send a message to, to the rest of the population. Uh, the second one was the takeover of social media companies like Kontakti, which used to uh, belong to Durov, uh, takeover by government-friendly oligarchs, and then very explicitly states is showing all your data is now being stored inside Russia and the KGB has access. I mean, it makes the NSA Snowden stuff look small fry. Like, basically, they're screaming, we know everything about you, and that kind of psychological intimidation is very, very strong. And then thirdly is probably the thing that we've heard the most about, which is the creation of not just government media online, which is obvious, but the troll farms. The troll <laughs> farms are, of course, directed first and foremost against the Russian opposition to change the mood online, change the conversation online. Later, they were used in a mean, spectacular, um, though rather, in its effects, spurious operation in the US that you may have heard of. Um, so, so those are the three things they, they, they chose. They, they keep on talking about um, something else. They keep on talking about creating firewalls, shutting off from the global internet. Um, and they've experimented with that, whether that's possible, whether that would be a step too far for the Russian people, you know, they're, they're seeing. We'll see. They're biding their time. So, so I'm interested because, like, you know, thinking about the powers of Telegram and, you know, Zuckerberg's Facebook empire and Instagram, probably looking at the Russian example, is this idea to build kind of a, you know, a, a national infrastructure like the way I mentioned it before? Judging from your experience, do you think it's kind of a, uh, a risky thing rather than trying to regulate the social media to? 
to actually create an alternative sphere for the distribution of, of news media? What do you think about I think, this? I think, I think it's critical. I think that's where we're at. I think it's worth looking at the 19, 1920s uh, and the creation of the BBC. Uh, Lord Reith, who created the BBC, was working in a radio environment, which is very similar to our environment with the internet. First, there was euphoria. Radio would bring people together and end all wars because people would listen to each other across continents and understand there's nothing to fight about. Very quickly, radio is weaponized by totalitarian regimes. Hitler puts a cheap radio, uh, the Volksradio, in every home. Mm. Germany has the highest number of radio listeners in the world. Um, and there's mass polarization happening through other forms of media. And, and Reith, who creates the BBC, starts going, okay, how do we create a different model? How do we use radio in another way? And he comes up with this idea of a, of a public broadcaster whose aim is to bring people together, which is not run on commercial interests, because commercial interests are virtually always linked to polarization, because you're stoking up your subscribers against the other side's subscribers. That's how it works. It's terrible for democracy in the long run. And um, thus the BBC appeared as this place where it's just uncommercialized, non-state, where the country can meet and talk to itself and where it has news and other vital forms of information. We have to think about what is, what is the equivalent of the BBC in terms of, let's say, social media design. I think it's definitely a space where your data is not being sucked or sucked. It's definitely a place which is not run by likes and shares and retweets. It's definitely a place where the the algorithms are, have public oversight and are done towards an idea of the public good. And it's a place where, um, to the extent that your data is accessible, it's done for things like health, uh, which I think we do agree there is some, you know, there's something valuable about contributing our data to better understand health crises. Um, so it's a different form of, of, of social media space with different types of relationships where you do all sorts of useful things. You do all sorts of things like, you know, get your roads fixed and pay your taxes and get your information and find about education and all these things that people really, really need. But what also empowers people, I think, to, to have a voice in, in political change and in society. That's... It can't be a boring space because I can just see the EU or, or the Germans creating an ideal democratic social media, which is super boring. So mm. it has to tap into some something of the joy and something of the emotional satisfaction that democracy gives you. Because what they're very good at, you know, the current social media, they satisfy very, very strong desires for, you know, narcissism, shall we say, or performing yourself yeah. or attention. These are very deep things. They're very, very necessary. I, and that's why they're so addictive. I, I think we, I, I really thank you, Peter, and I really want to pull in, um, uh, Dr. Malka Alder, um, she's uh, an absolute expert in this on this field. She's a science fiction author and sociologist. Malka, sorry for letting you wait a bit. It's kind of a challenge to run this um, the way we're running it on Zoom here and with an audience. So it's kind of like um, a, a double experience. And so Malka uh, received her doctorate from Sciences Po. Um, bonsoir, Malka. Um, are you still around? Can I can I hear you, see you? I am completely here and Thank I've you. enjoyed listening. No problem waiting, and although I did have to bite my tongue a couple of times. Oh yeah, that's really good because just let me just let me finish here. You're also <laughs> a faculty associate at the Arizona State University School for the Future of Innovation in Society. And she's a self-defined hope punk. In her Centennial trilogy, which starts with the book Infomocracy, and she's she wrote about the relationship between, you know, data and information structures and uh, democracy. Hello, Marka, welcome. Thank you. So start, go ahead. You wanted to raise some points. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, this has been a really great discussion so far and I've been really uh, interested in what people are saying, but I do want to, I do want to hammer a few things and uh, reinforce some things and also uh, take some issue with parts of your premise and starting this off. Shoot. Um, one thing that I, <laughs> um, one thing that I think, you know, as in the example that Peter just gave about radio, as much as this feels new and different to us, it's not entirely new. All of the things that you've mentioned about social media, 
uh, and about the entire news ecosystem now. If you want to talk about bubbles and people only listening to what they want, when I grew up in my town, in my city, there were two newspapers. And if you knew which newspaper a person subscribed to, that told you about their politics. And I think that was true in the US and in a city of any size. I imagine in Europe as well. Mm. Mm, not would so have, much. Would you have two newspapers in a city or yeah. more? Yeah. Mm. A, a little bit of that. We have a little bit of that. And that's 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 a, a media bubble. And in the US, it certainly got even more exacerbated with TV news. I mean, it used to be that there were the the anchormen, you know, the big anchormen. And there were three or four of them. But the other thing to notice about that is that those anchor men were all men. And they were all working for large corporations that were run by white men and that presented certain viewpoints. And so when you talk about some of these social media empires um, being owned by one person, uh, as Ben pointed out, you know, the New York Times is also owned by one family. And they're not necessarily accountable any more than these uh, social media empires are. Hmm. And if we talk about the problems of knowing, if we talk about these organized campaigns of different kinds of disinformation, remember the main, which was a, uh, what was called at, at the time, a yellow press campaign that started a war, the Cuban American war, um, based on what was basically wild uh, speculation over what had happened to a ship that exploded in the harbor of Havana. Uh, that was at the end of the 19th century. So these things have been happening. Um, what's new for us, and what I think Peter picked up on really nicely, is that the way that it's happening has changed. The modalities have changed. The pace has changed. Uh, and that's why, the, as, as Peter said, you know, the types of regulation, the types of reaction that we are, are starting to this are often quite off from what they need to be in order to deal with what the actual threat is in this particular mode of disinformation and what is really information control, often really by elites. Um, so, you know, when you talk about a bot farm, people pay for that. When you talk about propaganda being free while the quality news is expensive, there's a reason it's free. It's free because someone is paying for it because the people with money want to be promoting this, these types of information. And so, you know, for me, I think you have to come back again and look at what the power structures are and what the economic structures so, are. So we know the economic structures. It's all companies owned by men, mostly, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> yeah. And run by them um, because they have some sort of like majority stakeholder, uh, the sh the shareholder um, um, structures. Or, and so, or because um, they're friends with the, the leader of a country or... Right. Um, you know, Ben has been reporting about like Mark Zuckerberg's meeting with Donald Trump, the dinner situation, and we don't know what they were really sure, talking but, about. I mean, but, also not new for, for media, for the people who were, who had control of media. But, 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 um, you know, my argument is that we should set up like a collectively owned, like a public social network um, run basically by a public broadcaster, not directly controlled by the government, but in some sort of like, um, you know, uh, set up as a foundation or an independent, um, you know, um, service that is, um, that is not under direct state control and not owned by a single individual. So wouldn't that be a great uh, solution to your problem <laughs> of single person ownership? Now you say this to me in part because this is my book, <laughs> and, I, and I appreciate that. And yeah, and um, so, so your book really play out the scenario in your book, Infomocracy, the whole um, world that you're designing. I think it's really it, interesting for everyone. It here. really does play out the scenario, and it really... Um, 60 years ahead, right? Sort 60 of. years ahead. I, I can give you the spiel for the people who haven't, who haven't read it. Okay. 60 years ahead, it's a post-nation state uh, world in which there's a unit, basic unit of governance called a sentinel, which is 100,000 people, right? And that, because it's population-based, not territory-based, it could be some really dense city blocks, it could be just wide rural areas that are sparsely populated, but each of those can vote for any government it wants out of all the governments that exist in the world. So a government might have constituents in these little, in these little units, scattered all over the world, or they might have only a few. And if you're walking down a city street, you could easily cross into several different countries, as it were, by crossing streets. 
Um, and all of this is facilitated by this giant global bureaucracy that is entirely dedicated to information management that I named information. Have I regretted that since? Maybe. Uh, it's still hard for me to type that word without a capital. And this, so this, this global you, bureaucracy. It's, it's sort of a Google merged with the UN, right? It's a sort of Google meets UN. It's, it, people sometimes compare it to Big Brother, but it's in a way kind of the opposite of Big Brother because it does pull all the information in the world in and there's quite a lot of surveillance that goes on. Um, but its a real purpose is to push that information out and make sure that everybody has access to and all the information they need to make decisions, fundamentally decisions about democracy, but also other de decisions like about commercial consumption and so on. Um, so they, they put a lot of, there's this huge bureaucracy, all these people, um, and yeah, a lot of people as opposed to, to algorithms, although there's some algorithm work in there as well. Um, and they, they try to make sure that people have the information that they need, that they have it at different reading levels, that it can be read to them out loud if they need it to be read. Uh, they um, will annotate politicians' speeches. They will find people for publicly stating lies as part of a speech or an advertisement. And, and so it's this, this uh, massive organization that supposedly is there in a facilitation sort of role, right? Why, why, um, why does your world need this giant you know, information monopolist um, why is it so, so important, my, the relationship in between democracies in your world and this information distribution system? So my world, in terms of the, the, the new governance system I propose, which I call micro-democracy, doesn't actually need that. But what does need something <laughs> is democracy itself. And I'm trying to make the point that for us to have a democracy that we can actually consider worthy of the name, we need to have information that is accessible to the voters, to the people who live in these countries, um, in any country that, that wants to be a democracy. That information needs to be a fundamental part of the system and not some throwaway add-on that you leave either to the vagaries of the market or to, I mean, you, have, you, you also have to be really careful as we all know with public broadcasting um, and who has control over that. And so uh, in, in I, t I sort of explore this idea over Three books, and, and I came up with the idea because I was so upset about these very bubbles that we've been talking about and how hard it was for me to have a conversation with someone who took in different types of information than I did. And I got, you know, I was just, I was very frustrated because I love having arguments with people who disagree with me and I couldn't do that anymore because the disagreements had gotten so fundamental and divided on, on, on the basis that it was, it was no longer possible. And I just thought, gosh, I really want an, an adult in the room of our information media. And, and I had this idea for this, you know, one monolithic site where everyone could go and just agree on the basic stuff that would say, this is what we know, these are the things we don't know, here's all the data links, here are different uh, visualizations of it. And it sounds really great, but as soon as I thought of it, I thought this is a terrible idea because it is both a great and a terrible idea. Because as soon as you have that, it can be uh, taken over, it can be twisted. How, how's your, how's aware. information, the organization in your book being controlled? Uh, well, the, I mean, the books kind of cover, because they cover a certain amount of time, they cover an evolution in, in and I can't, I can't give it all away right now, Hannes, but um, th what, it, what the books show is that this, this bureaucracy of all these people who work for it, most of whom are really people who are, who are trying to, to do things, for good, who are trying to, to work for a world where democracy works better and, and people have better options, uh, they find it's really a struggle. Um, they find it's a struggle to get people to pay attention, even with uh, this massive amount of, of information mm. that's been carefully compiled and curated and made easy to read for them. Um, and, and they find it's a really a struggle to the point of impossibility to try to be neutral or to try to make these judgment calls that you're talking about, about what information should be included and shouldn't and how you present it. And they, in, the, in my books, in the, the, the theory of this, they move away from the idea of neutrality and kind of say neutrality is impossible, we're not even going to pretend it. And they move towards the principle of transparency, which is basically, you know, here's the person who wrote this, this is, you know, where they're coming from, this is how they thought about it, here's all the data that went into it, uh, which is, it, it's something. And, you know, for me, I think, I, I wasn't proposing this as a perfect system, as I said, you know, it's, the book is really wrestling with this idea. I, I am proposing it as a sort of funhouse mirror to where we are now, to point out the problems with our current system. Um, but I do think that one of the major issues we're dealing with now is this, 
this transition, that we're in a moment of real transition where we have been uh, seeing the problems with the, the previous system of authority, legitimacy, and gatekeepers. And gatekeepers has a very negative connotation, but uh, as you're suggesting, we, we need some, some kind of moderation of, the, of the, this flow of information. So I don't mean it necessarily in a negative way, but I do mean that our previous system is, is breaking down. But and we need to figure out new ways of dealing with with how we mm -hmm. how we judge so, the information we get. So you who has been considering these things for around a decade now, um, you know, thinking about it, what do you think of this idea to set up this, you know, um, this uh, a national, you know, distribution network that you know all media producers can use as long as they adhere to certain, you know, widely acknowledged. Um, standards that are actually also, you know, uh, watched over by probably a public, you know, institution, like a commission. There could be um, people, you know, um, there could be, you know, public democratic decisions over how the algorithm um, that distributes information to the citizens is actually being, you know, um, built and shaped and how it works. Um, what do you see as, as the issues here from your perspective? I see the issue is going to be those standards that you mentioned, because that is the place where there's going to be disagreement about what those standards should be. That's the place where there are going to be accusations that uh, uh, some media were let in because they are belong to someone wealthy right. or someone connected to the government and whether they meet the standards or not. These are always going to be qualitative decisions. Right, and but so these, these discussions are already here. But they're actually yeah. externalized to some, you know, uh, private business for-profit company like uh, uh -huh. Facebook, who's actually having these discussions in their closed uh, boardrooms, probably. So wouldn't As it be comparably other much better? Media had those discussions in the past and continue to do so. Um, you know, as the, the New York Times does. Uh -huh. uh, you know, I, I agree with Peter that algorithms and the way that data is used on the internet is, is, is a huge problem and is really where we should be looking at. But I disagree somewhat at saying that previous media were, were much more transparent than that. I mean, I think my knowing that Rupert, Rupert Modark owns a certain outlet and my seeing the first 10 hits all coming from Russia today gives me more or less a similar ability to gauge what I'm dealing with in terms of, of how those decisions were made and, and how much trust I should put in them. Yeah. Um, but, but, but that aside, you know, that, that analogy to the past aside, I do, I do think, I do believe very strongly that information in general is a public good and that we need to be putting more public infrastructure money towards that. I do think that the, the hard infrastructure part is definitely something that governments should be thinking about investing in more now because that's a lot of control uh, that is in the hands of, of private companies um, and private companies that moreover are increasingly uh, multinational and decreasingly have really any any obligation or any are, are they're not controlled as much by national governments. Um, so definitely the hard infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, I would like certainly to see things like you propose starting to come up as alternatives. Um, I think we we need to do a lot of experimenting. You know, I think as Peter was talking about that we need the, the algorithms, algorithms to be transparent and so on. But he also said then no likes and retweetings. But that's part of the, it's not only part of what makes things exciting and not boring. It's also part of what makes them democratic. Right. Um, and yeah, it leads to a lot of viral misuse, but that's because the people with money are always gonna learn how to misuse whatever system you have up. Um, on the other hand, you know, I can hear so many different voices going on Twitter than I would ever have been able to hear by reading a newspaper or, or watching a cable show that has complete control over, uh, well, the newspaper particularly has complete control over what letters to the editor they publish. The cable show has, you know, depending if they let people call in, but they're probably doing some screening. Um, so there's, there's, there's give and takes to these, these new systems, and we need to really experiment to figure out what will work to give people um, the, the the, the benefits of the positives of what these can offer while uh, cracking down on, on the misuse. But, you know, uh, I do think that you have to be, you have to be ready for this, not only, you have to be ready for it not to work perfectly, um, either yeah. because people don't want to use it or because people are angry about it and find ways to use uh, the mm. system to undermine it. You know, Malka, um, 
Just very quickly before we dive into the discussion, um, I'm getting questions here already. Um, like, to what degree um, do you think, um, uh, you know, a, a shared base reality is actually um, possible even as an, as an idea? Isn't that, you know, speaking as a sociologist, isn't that a ridiculous idea to aim well, at creating this? Possible or something that we want to have? I, I would say, Hannes, I think that the question of a shared reality is one that needs to go into education rather than information. I think with uh, news, especially the way we're accustomed to it now, it happens so fast that to try to have, to try to impose those standards you're talking about and to have people judge every bit of information and fact check it. I mean, we need to either slow down our news, which we should probably do anyway, but it's not gonna happen 100%. Um, you can throw an enormous bureaucracy at it, like the one I described in my book. It's still not going to completely work. We need people to have an education um, from which they can make some of these judgment calls themselves. I'm sorry, Peter, but media literacy, it won't do the whole job, as you said, I agree. Um, but, but we need to have some of that. We do need to have some of this critical thinking. And as I say that, it's the same as what I mentioned in my book. Education that presents a shared reality is great. It's also a terrible idea because that is how we get, you know, textbooks that for decades after will continue to, to for example, spread lies about uh, slavery in the Civil War in the United States or colonialism in the UK or uh, any, any other um, controversial bit of history that we can imagine. Those do create a shared reality. That is how you get people who come out of their basic schooling and then learn some facts about the world from a different perspective. So, so if, I get, if, I, if I get you correctly, you would rather invest in uh, media literacy and let Facebook and Twitter no, move no, 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 on, no, no, let no. the media fall apart and think no, it'll, no, 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 no. <laughs> it'll I, all work I, out. I, I do agree with Peter that media literacy alone is not enough. But I do think that education in general, not just media literacy, but actual education uh -huh. is something that, that is fundamental to having, again, a democracy and certainly for allowing people to deal with, with the media environment that we, the information environment that we live in. Uh, you know, we, we are dealing with, with constant flows of information. And as Peter said, we cannot moderate that content bit by content bit. So, for example... We need to have, mm. pe we need to have people who are able to, to think about it. In your we world... Also uh, regulate sorry. Uh, the companies. Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead, sorry. It's just, I'm, I'm so short on time. In your world, would yes. um, information have, you know, Ben is Ben Smith, um, who I hope is still with us, is such a daring um, publisher. Um, so he, you remember when he published a steel dossier right after Trump, you know, was inaugurated, I think, talking about like um, how he was involved in Russian business. And some of it, you know, turned out to be, you know, had to be retracted. Other elements turned out to be true, you know, and factual. And so it's really hard in, in the news business, you know, to, to actually, you're like, you're on an ongoing, you know, um, truth-finding process. And if you mm -hmm. have an institution that defines what truth is very sharply and neatly, then things kind of like break down, isn't it? So journalism is trying to approach I mean, the facts. If you have an institution that can define what truth is very sharply, it can have a doctoral degree in philosophy because I don't think anyone has ever done that yet. Right. And, you know, right. and, and however you do do it, it's always going to be from a certain perspective. Mm. So let's dive into the discussion. Um, so is there, um, I was told there were questions coming um, online. Um, if you like to, you can send them to me. If not, just raise your arms. Um, uh, Peter, Malka, and Ben are still with us. Um, it's really hot in here, Malka. You would, you would not think it's so hot. So but you should I'm, take off your jacket, Hannes, since you've already taken off your pants. And it's part of the joke, right? <laughs> <laughs> part of the home office um, culture we're celebrating. Um, so is there people, um, how do you feel in the room? How do you feel, how would you feel about a system of a kind of a, like a, you know, a Swiss or, you're not Swiss, probably a German Facebook um, that is just a neutral provider of, you know, your, your local dailies and, you know, your, your, the, all the TV news. You can actually have it all. Would you, would you like that idea or would you think it's a terrible um, centralized uh, version of Facebook run by the government? 
Is there anyone who would be in favor of setting up um, a, a, a form of like um, social network for news? I have one person out of 30, that's really bad. Sasha. Hi, Hannes. Um, I think it's a great idea. I think, uh, but I have uh, some questions. First of all, uh, who's going to finance it? Is it the government? Uh, I think that might be also an issue. Yeah. Um, uh, the other, I have an the other question I have is: uh, Is it more run by the government, or is it more a multi-stakeholder approach? Uh, um, it's, uh, I, I think the way the um, Swiss public broadcaster is financed is through yearly um, you know, payments, um, like you have in Germany, GEZ Gebühren, um, and which are just being used to like, produce the content thus far and run their infrastructure. And they're organized as um, an um, independent foundation, so they have their own governance board, Right, and so um, they're not actually. There's no politicians deciding over their course to take. So they are free in their editorial uh, decisions. And I think that that would basically be a similar structure because we we have a public process of of you know appointing these members, and it's known. That it's slightly politicized, but in its daily actions, it's independent and it's sort of long term, like five year ish, the oversight board. Okay, but the German system itself is not uh, independent from uh, uh, the German politics. Uh, as you know, in the uh, Rundfunkgeräte and so on, there are German politicians uh, in there. So uh, uh, people who are, let's say, the, the very right-wing people, yeah, mm -hmm. who don't believe in this German GZ system, mm -hmm. yeah, they hate it, they really hate it. Um, and people are uh, uh, biased because they think uh, this is uh, uh, run by the government and Angela Merkel is telling them what to write. So uh, uh, if you install such a system in, in Germany, it should be really independent. Mm -hmm. And then I think it shouldn't be only financed through taxpayers' money or the government. Uh, it, sh it should be organized differently so mm -hmm. that people get the feeling that it's mm -hmm. really independent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's actually not taxes, it's a payment separate from taxes. It's a different bill that arrives with a different distribution mechanism in Switzerland at least. So it's not you know, managed with by, by politicians' decisions on how to spend it. There's a company being appointed on how, uh, to, to actually get, pull in the money and then to uh, give it to the public broadcaster. Um, which is a different company from the public broadcaster itself. So it's a fairly um, elaborate um, system, I think. But you're right, um, it has to be independent. I was wondering at all if, you know, my idea was basically that if we, if we kind of like set it up in a small country like Switzerland, which is like a multi-language uh, uh, country across three or four uh, languages at least, um, it might be a good test run for, you know, bigger countries and, and you know, probably um, the EU. But I was wondering, you know, it's, I don't conceive it as possible in the United States, for example. Ben, if you're still with us, is there any chance of setting up kind of like a, a national public um, infrastructure for media distribution? What do you think is... No, I mean, there, is, there, are, there are state... There, I mean, no. I mean, and in fact, right, what's happening right now is that Donald Trump is very aggressively seizing control of the kind of vestigial public broadcasting infrastructure that there is, which is the Voice of America. It's mostly aimed at non, it, it's by law can only serve, um, it's, it, you know, it's a, it's a outside the U.S. It's a soft, it's a diplomacy tool, not a, not really a domestic information service. But, um, you know, if Donald Trump, has been very focused on taking control of it and using using it for sort of his his variety of propaganda. I think it's very hard to do in a very deeply divided society. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you, what 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 would be your um, if you think outside of the U.S. Um, do you think it would be uh, worthwhile? You know, imagine you had a you know a, you know like a tool where you can basically publish, but it's. It's not commercial, so there are no, there are not Facebook 
business interest. And it's only for the distribution um, of, of news, accredited news sources that qualify with a certain board who just double checks that it's kind of like a known source, the address. Um, I mean, I think it would have to like market itself extremely competitively in the attention economy. But it could. I mean, it's not to say that government services can't. It could also have a budget of 100 times any commercial rival and, you know, the way the BBC does and make it up that way. Mm. But it's hard. I'm, it's a crowded space. I, I, and, I'm, and I think that, you know, ultimately, there were, you would, it would probably find the group of people, like, you know, that you would have, it would, it would, a little bubble would develop around it, is my, is my guess. But I think Switzerland is probably the ideal place to try this out. If it could work anywhere. <laughs> um, interesting. Um, what, are there other questions? Oh, there's a question. Please. The microphone's coming over. Um, please address uh, the speakers, if you like, to by name, the panelists. Mm -hmm. okay. um, feel of the, the, many of the themes that you're talking about is very much presented in the, the Wag the Dog. I think that shows a lot of how the media is working, you know, but that's 30 years ago. Um, my question is, I'm interested to understand how the mechanism of embedded journalism uh, functions at a higher level. How does um, um, you know, uh, uh, embedded journalism, like the war in Iraq with Alan Powell and you know, the speech in the United Nations, and then the journalists go to Iraq and they film everything, and, they, and then it gets sent it, uh, sent mm -hmm. all over the world. Mm -hmm. How does it get qualified or accepted in Europe or in in England, in Britain? How does the BBC uh, have a policy towards embedded journalism? How does it uh, function that these things get accepted? That you know it's all been uh, uh, edited and uh, restricted and put in a box and. Uh, um, packaged and sent out uh, that it's supposed to have a special effect. How, do, how does it have an, uh, How does it get accepted? How is the process of getting accepted at the higher level? The people that make the decisions. Mm. Ben, ben, would you would you be able to uh, answer the questions about the 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 um, uh, the editorial policies towards embedded journalism at your uh, newspaper? You know, I don't know. I actually don't know, and I, so I'm, I'm hesitant to try to answer that question. Yeah, same, same as with me. So in the magazine that I work, um, we, I, I don't any, actually remember any sort of like embedded journalism um, piece. So um, it. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people learn the lesson of Iraq in a way, and but mm -hmm. but you know, more broadly, obviously, there is a principle that you know access is a curse. Yeah. And I think it plays, em, embedding is just the most extreme version of that. Mm -hmm. So, so um, embedded journalism is kind of a 1990s debate with the Iraq war, and it's basically, it's basically it has fallen out of favor amongst... Early 2000s. Sorry? Ben, you... Early 2000s. Early 2000s, yeah. Sorry. It's really, it's, it seems to be such a long time ago. And... Um, yeah. Um, no, I haven't done any embedded journalism, I think, in, in the way it's meant in the Iraq war. I'm sorry. Yeah, another question? Um, is there something coming on, on social media? Um, okay. Any questions in the room here? So are we enjoying the 30? Oh, there's a question in the back. No? Okay. I think it's so hot, basically everyone is, <laughs> is like zoning out here. Um, okay, I get, um, I get an impossible in the US, but you, you might want to try it out in, the, um, in Switzerland from you, Ben. Um, I, I get um, similar things have happened in the 1920s. Um, probably we should try it out. Um, Peter, do you think there's any... Um, any way of imagining, you know, I know the BBC has this like amazing research uh, arm. Um, do you think, um, you know, um, there's any way of imagining this uh, sort of social network for news in, in the UK? Well, so, so here's a tragic story that I'm, I'm telling through rumor and hearsay, but apparently there was a team at the BBC who realized very early on that we need just that, that the future of the BBC is designing 
a BBC internet social network. It's the early days. And it had several geniuses working on this, uh, real blue sky thinkers. And again, allegedly, because I've known this only from conversations in the pubs around the BBC, um, and those sources are not reliable, but sometimes interesting. When this was tabled, this was at the time the BBC is always under huge pressure not to get too much in the way of the market. And the answer was, oh my God, but this will warp the digital market. There's these exciting new companies like Facebook and Twitter, and they're great. And it was stopped. It was killed. So mm. people saw the future. They completely got it. More publicly, people like Dan Hind, who's a person who thinks about the public sphere, proposed ages ago the idea of a British digital cooperative. Mm. He uses the word cooperative a lot, and you might need to explain in person what he means by that. But look, people got this very early. People in the research and development part of the BBC got this very early, and they were blocked. Hmm. Now everyone is like, oh my God, what did we do? We surrendered our democracy to likes and shares. And let's, discuss, let's, let's carry on this discussion about likes and shares and why I have a problem with them. Um, they are a choice. You know, the Facebook and Twitter, that is a metaphor for our, we're in Germany, spiritual state. Hmm. I can use the word spiritual because we're in a German context and you're allowed to talk about geists. They're a metaphor for our for how we react to the world and it's a fascistic and I mean this very in a very concrete way, fascistic reaction. Down kill mm -hmm. yes all hail the power mm -hmm. all down. It's two reactions. Thumbs up, thumbs down, like a, a mob rule. It's horrible. It has reduced Twitter where you just go for more retweets is a little narcissism machine, more attention. It's, you know, Twitter gave birth to people like, you know, politicians like, like Trump and Salvini. We can say it started with TV, it did, but then TV, uh, social media just took it to a different dimension. So these are metaphors that have shriveled our, our psychological uh, world, kind of our social psychological reactions and have shriveled our, our cognitive and emotional patterns. So uh, in Texas, at the Center for Media Engagement, uh, where they experiment with these things, they just switched the like button for a respect button. Mm. And immediately you had different kinds of reactions. People were ready to respect uh, statements made by the other political side. Mm. Immediately, just one button changes already mm. um, people's uh, interaction with, with each other and with the information. Mm. So, so I'm not saying that we, you know, uh, uh, we have to be very ca careful when we kind of link. And I'm sure that's not what my, my colleague on the panel meant, but just generally I hear this used by the tech companies a lot. Why are you complaining? Our likes and shares are what you want. This is what you want. We're just giving you what you want, which is, of course, the, the old arguments of, 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 of Murdoch. Like, you guys want mob mentality. You want to, you know, destroy other people while putting them on a pinnacle. We're just giving you what you want, which I think is one of the most pernicious, fake, disingenuous, and genuinely corrosive arguments that they make. Uh, and when they make arguments like that, and when we hear them making those arguments, I think that's when for a lot of us, we're like, okay, we have to regulate these guys. Mm. For a long time, we believed their propaganda. We believed mm. that when they said, we don't believe in evil Google, or we believe in connecting people, Facebook. We kind of believe it because they took our language. They took the language of mm -hmm. deliberative democracy and liberal democracy, and they co-opted the language of, of the struggle for freedom of expression. Yeah. And, and then they kind of twisted it and perverted it to very, very, dare I say, low-level low profit aims. Um, so yes, I do think we need a non-profit space. Mm -hmm. Of course, it'll have its own version of likes and shares, but let's make them rich, and nuanced and the sort of information spreading that helps deepen debates, that helps enrich debates, mm. that doesn't push us towards, you know, the most base forms of emotional polarization. Huh. So you think even debate should be on it. I'm not sure about whether this is actually um, possible um, to have debate. Oh, I think on that's it. key. That's um. key. We have to have no 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 we can't go back to the old to the old model of filtering, filtering information and then filtering decision-making. It's clear that there's a demand for much closer decision-making. I'm not a believer in referendums, like Twitter referendums. God, no. I'm not a believer in, like, like, mm. like, we've just had 
direct democracy in a referendum here in Britain. It wasn't great. Mm. I'm not a believer in that, but people have to feel, not feel, people have to know that they're having an input into the system. Look, some of the most interesting research about kind of conspiracy theories is about the people who uh, believe in conspiracy theories, which are such a you know, disease on our democracy, are people who have low sense of, of empowerment. Yes, yeah, that sense of powerlessness is connected to conspiracy theories. We have to think about ways that people become invested into government decision-making and to decision-making at the local level uh, in order to feel more empowered, to be more empowered. Mm. Uh, and I think, yes, we of course we should think about how the internet can, can make that happen. Um, uh -huh. Again, I don't mean direct democracy every day. I don't mean like a Twitter mm. poll on every policy. Mm. Uh, that would be stupid as well. No liquid but, but democracy. that's where we have to think. Mm. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, so I, don't mean, I don't mean that. I don't mean Twitterocracy either. Thank you, Peter. So, Malka, just as a, a, a final question to you, um, if I may ask, um, you know, for me, looking at the, you know, decay in the media sphere, the increasing power of the social networks, and, you know, politicians in the U.S. warning that democracy is basically uh, under, uh, under a sincere, you know, uh, risk right now, at what point in your uh, science fiction world um, that you're describing in infomocracy, did it become necessary to build this public information infrastructure that you, t that you called uh, information, Marka? At what point do we have to set up um, something? <laughs> we have to do something uh, yesterday, I think. Um, I, I do want to put one point about the, the structure in my book to answer that previous question about funding. In the book, the, this information is funded out of a trust coming from the um, damage is awarded in a civil suit against the cable news networks for lying. Um, and then there was a further uh, civil suit that was against actually diet soda for lying in their advertisements for years and years. And there was a large amount of money awarded. It went into a trust and that has funded this giant infrastructure of um, information management. Um, so there's an option for you. But when did they set uh, it up and why? You know, what's the point in time where we really have to go for it? I'm telling you, in your now, world. we have to do something now. Maybe not that. As I said, I wasn't trying to describe a perfect system or utopia or the answer, but we need to start changing things because the, the media environment we live in is, is a problem. Um, and, and if I can just also speak a little bit to what Peter was saying, I think we agree quite a bit more than, than he thinks we do. And I certainly agree that the social media, we could have much, much healthier social media interactions and, and frameworks and user interfaces uh, if we regulated these companies, changed the incentives around it, uh, had a whole bunch, just a whole different approach to, to how we deal with it. Um, but I also do think, you know, that we need to look at it very carefully uh, to consider the, the benefits of it as well, because uh, Peter mentioned earlier how we, we initially thought, you know, that Facebook and Twitter had done some great things for, for activism and for overthrowing certain regimes and so on. And they did, actually. I and mean, they, they are a tool for activism as well as a tool for fascism. And, yeah, they're tilted more towards fascism increasingly um, as we see these companies both consolidating themselves what they want to be. And we also see people, uh, the people who do have the, the leisure and the money and the influence to, to really exploit them. Um, we see it being used more and more on that side. Uh, but we, we need to keep in mind that they are, they do have a p democratic potential. Yes, it should be done differently and regulated and uh, ideally have different people in charge. But, you know, it's not only a tool for narcissism because it, I just, I feel like I learned so much uh, by, through the people that I follow, um, through academics, through artists, through people who have very different uh, viewpoints than I do. And so I think that there, there are the things there that we want to make sure that we keep. Um, and yeah, we need to do it. We need to do something now, Hannes. So, so get started, yeah. build your new infrastructure, get public investment, get other investment, uh, and then be prepared for it to have problems and be prepared to, for it to have pitfalls and you know, build something new, build something else to compete with it. Okay. We've got to keep moving forward. Thank you so much for your time. To Malka, Ben, Peter, thank you to for contributing to in these difficult times where you're locked in in Amsterdam and in, in New York and in, in the UK. Thank you so much to the audience for being here and staying with me. That was incredible. It's so hot. It's above 30 degrees in this room like Celsius. And, 
And uh, thank you to everyone who sent in online questions, so n literally nobody, I guess. And goodbye, have a good evening. Thank you, a big round of applause to the speakers. Thank you.